Second care of patients with musculoskeletal trauma. This begins on page 1028. Our concepts are mobility and perfusion. Interrelated concepts are pain, tissue integrity, sensory perception, and infection. So this is a good x-ray of the hip fracture, just showing you, um, you see the little arrows there pointing to the intertrochanter fracture. This occurs 70% of the time when somebody has a hip fracture. So our exemplar will be on fractures. This is a break or disruption in the continuity of bone that affects mobility and causes pain. If you look at figure 47.1, um, they are showing a closed fracture and an open fracture. They are classified as complete or incomplete. An open fracture is also known as a compound fracture. A closed fracture is also known as a simple fracture. So when it's closed, the bone is not displaced. When it's open, the bone has moved, as you can see in that second figure there, and often protrudes outside the skin. Um, they're also classified due to their um, fragility. They're either pathologic or spontaneous fractures, fatigue or stress, or compression fracture. So remember the compression fracture happens in the vertebrae and it's due to the downward force, the downward force on the vertebrae. Common types of fractures. The figure on the right portrays several common types. So you see the closed, the displaced, or opened. You see the comminuted, excuse me, or fragmented. That's when they have the little um, pieces of bone floating around. We have um, a completely displaced where the bone doesn't protrude out of side of the skin, but the bone, as you can see, is not in alignment at all. Then you have an oblique fracture, which um, means that there's a crack going sort of diagonally. You have actually a spiral fracture, which is where the crack will go around and around the bone. Um, then you have an impacted, where um, the bone has been forced downward and you have what's called an, a green stick fracture. Complications include infection, compartment syndrome. Um, look at the key features on page 1031. It talks about acute compartment syndrome. But we're going to talk more about this. Um, but this is when there is so much pressure in the um, compartment that in other words, the area around the fracture, okay, um, that it cuts off the blood circulation and there can be um, the loss of limb, okay, it can completely cut off the, um, the blood vessels and nerves so that there has to be a loss of the limb and will just die. Also, um, a fat embolism is something that can happen you know what an embolism is, um, so fat can break off and start um, traveling in your blood vessels, end up in the lungs, causing dyspnea, decreased O2 sat, and tachypnea. The stages of bone healing are found on page 1030. Stage one is the first day to three days after an injury. A hematoma will form at the side of the fracture because the bone is so vascular. So if you look at figure 47.2, the stages, you can see that first stage where there's a lot of blood um, there and a hematoma forms. Stage two occurs three days to two weeks and you see some granulation tissue forming. Then stage three is um, when the bone healing occurs as a result of vascular and cellular proliferation. So you can see a callus is forming there. It is surrounded by new vascular tissue, which is known as the callus, within three to six weeks. The callus formation is the beginning of a non-bony union. So it starts um, bringing the two bones back together, um, but there's not actual bone there yet. In stage four, the callus gradually is reabsorbed and transformed into bone. So this stage usually takes three to eight weeks. 
And during the fifth and final stage, there is consolidation and remodeling of the bone. The process may start as early as four to six weeks after fracture and can continue for up to an entire year, depending on the severity of the break. Complications include DVT and PE, infection, acute compartment syndrome, fat embolism syndrome, and complex regional pain syndrome. The risk just depends on the location of the injury. For health promotion and maintenance, we want to teach about osteoporosis screening. There are many screenings done free of charge at hospitals and clinics, and people really need to take advantage of those. We want to teach home safety, including fall prevention, moving slowly, using your assistive devices as needed, um, you know, watching for signs of infection, make sure that um, your cast stays dry, things like that. Um, dangers of substance use and driving. We don't want, obviously, somebody having a wreck and having fractures, and also the use of helmets to protect the skull. In our assessment, we will be determining the cause of the fracture. We want to know about the events leading up to the injury that caused the fracture. We want to know if they're using any substances that are um, illegal or prescribed. And we want to know what kind of job they have, what kind of activities they do um, outside of working. We want to check their circulation. We want to check for sub-Q emphysema. Um, so check for trauma to other body systems. We also need to do a psychosocial assessment because it's going to be painful and they're not going to be able to move and they're going to be constipated eventually because of pain meds. Um, so they're going to tend to be depressed. Okay. If you look on page 1034, there is a box that says assess neurovascular status. So you want to know about that. Um, assessing neurovascular status in patients with a musculoskeletal injury. So you want to inspect the area distal to the injury. Um, you want to look at the color, the temperature, ask if the patient can move the area distal to the injury, um, ask them about sensation, if they can feel or if they have any pins and needles feeling. Um, also, always, always check pulses, check capillary refill, and ask about pain. Laboratory assessment. The H and H is going to be low. Your sedimentation rate is going to be high because of an inflammatory response. If the WBCs are high, that's because of infection. So you always want to keep an eye on that. Serum calcium and phosphorus are going to be high during healing because why? Well, because bones use those to build bone, right? As far as imaging assessments, you're going to look at x-rays. They also may do CT scans and MRIs. So we have acute pain, decreased mobility, potential for neurovascular compromise, and potential for infection. So we want to make sure they have adequate pain control, that they can ambulate. Remember, we want them as independent as possible with or without devices. Um, free of physiologic consequences. We want them to have adequate blood flow to the extremity, and we want them to remain free from infection. For home care management and self-management, don't put anything down the cast. Um, don't um, try not to itch um, underneath the cast, or I should say try not to scratch, right? Because they may itch, but we're going to try to help them not or try to tell them not to scratch. Um, take, of course, analgesics for pain um, as needed. They may need physical therapy. Um, lots of healthcare resources, home health, um, can help them with assistive devices and that type of thing. Our evaluation, we want them to have adequate pain control. We want them to be able to ambulate independently Remember, we want them as independent as possible with or without devices, unless they have traction, then they can't be ambulatory. Um, free of physiologic consequence, consequences, sorry, such as compartment syndrome. We want adequate blood flow and we want them to remain free of infection. 
This slide identifies the different types of hip fractures, where they exactly occur. Um, know that osteoporosis is the biggest risk factor for hip fracture. So you can have an in, intertrochanteric, a subtrochanteric. Remember, most of the hip fractures are intertrochanteric. A femoral neck fracture, subcapital, capital intercapsular is within the joint, and then extracapsular, which is outside of the joint. And this figure is on page 1042, so you can see it up close and personal. So other fractures of the lower extremity besides a hip fracture would include the lower two-thirds of the femur. This usually is caused by trauma. Um, same with the tibia fibula and the ankle and the foot, actually. So all of those are caused by trauma. And before I go on to talk about the chest and pelvis, I want you to look on page 1043. Um, when they do a hip replacement, they are going to use a prosthetic hip with a um, ball and this figure that you see here, figure 47.9. I'm not sure exactly what that is called, um, but this is the hip prosthesis. This um, will mimic the femoral head um, and be placed by the orthopedic surgeon. They can also do a hip screw used for open reduction with internal fixation. That is a term you will hear a lot in the hospital, the ORIF of the hip. Um, so that's used to keep everything in place and in alignment. Um, in other words, um, fixated. Okay. Now, going on to the rib rib and sternum, chest and pelvis. So um, this is on page 1045. The rib and sternum fracture. What do you think we need to assess? I'm pretty sure you can figure that we need to assess ABCs, right? Anytime you have compromise to the sternum or the ribs because they're so close to the lungs and your diaphragm and all your respiratory muscles, um, you want to assess ABCs. Pelvic fractures can be either non-weight bearing or weight bearing. Compression fractures of the spine, we talked about this. They're usually associated with osteoporosis or cancer, uh, metastatic bone cancer specifically. As far as non-surgical management, we're talking about, um, of course, analgesics, first of all. Definitely try to keep their pain under control. Um, we want to use physical therapy. We want to use nerve blocks. Anything that can um, keep them mobile or um, keep them from getting infections um, and keep them comfortable. Okay. So that's non-surgical management. Now, as far as surgical management, there are things called vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. These are minimally invasive procedures um, where they can um, go in and re-expand a compressed vertebral body, okay? Um, they can also inject bone cement directly through the skin and into the um, affected area. This usually provides immediate pain relief and also gives them a lot of stability. If you would like to learn more about that, you can look at nursing care for patients having vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. This is on page 1046 and you should go over that box there. Okay, amputation. Our exemplar begins on page 1046. It is obviously a removal of part of the body, okay? Um, it can be elective or it may be emergent when a trauma has happened. Usually elective amputations happen when um, there is peripheral vascular disease and the circulation is so bad that they have lost pulses lost circulation and there's um, been necrosis happening in the tissue. 
different levels of amputation. They usually start with the smallest area possible, um, and unfortunately, they will continue to keep amputating um, until, you know, for instance, they'll take toes, one toe, two toes, then all five toes, then part of a foot, and then the entire foot, okay? The um, amputation of any part of an upper extremity is more incapaci incapacitating, generally, than um, a lower extremity because other than walking, we generally use our upper extremities for more activities, okay? Complications include hemorrhage, infection, phantom limb pain, which is a real thing, neuroma, and flexion contracture. One thing you need to know about phantom limb pain is that if people are complaining of phantom limb pain, you do go ahead and give them pain medication, okay? If pain is long-standing, especially if it existed before the amputation, any stimulus can cause phantom leg pain or phantom extremity pain, um, including touching any part of the body may set off the phantom limb pain wherever you remove the limb. A neuroma is a tumor that um, consists of damaged nerve cells. It can form um, often an amputation of an upper extremity, okay? But it can occur anywhere. This causes a lot of pain. Um, they're going to need peripheral nerve block, or steroid injections. They can use even hypnosis sometimes um, for the neuroma. The flexion contractures are um, hip and knee fractures, excuse me, contractures, most often seen in patients with amputation of the lower extremity, okay? This can be avoided um, by ambulating the patient with a prosthetic advice, device, not advice, um, proper positioning and active range of motion exercises in the early post-op period help to prevent the contractures. Levels of amputation, the above the knee amputation, abbreviated AKA, below the knee, abbreviated BKA, midfoot amputation, the SIM amputation, and the toe amputation. So um, the midfoot and the SIM are sign, um, it just depends on how much of the foot they're taking, okay? as you can see in the figure there. So now when you see left BKA or right AKA, you'll know that that patient has had an amputation. If they've had both legs, then it will be, it will say bilateral BKA or bilateral AKA. So obviously um, with our health promotion and maintenance, we want them to hopefully not be obese. We don't want them to smoke. We want them to try to have some activity level um, regularly, avoid any risky behaviors, um, and also adhere to their diabetic disease management program. Um, we want to prevent further amputations. We want to assess their neurovascular status. So we're looking at pulses, skin color, skin temperature, all of those things, sensation. Um, psychosocially, the loss of even a, like the pinky toe, anything can really cause people um, some serious depression. They will actually go through a grieving process. So you can imagine if somebody has um, amputation, you know, different levels happening and they've had many surgeries um, that that can really cause them to have a lot of mental issues. Diagnostic tests we can do. Um, the ABI, remember the ankle brachial index we learned about, where you compare the systolic blood pressure in the brachial um, to the ankle blood pressure. The uh, Doppler is where you um, use a Doppler to um, find the pulses. Um, it's a non-invasive test, obviously. I think you've all seen a Doppler used before. The TCPO2 
is the ultrasonography and laser Doppler measure the um, speed of flow in the limb. So this measures oxygen pressure to indicate blood flow in the limb and is reliable for predicting healing. Our hypotheses include potential for decreased tissue perfusion, acute or persistent pain, decreased mobility, and decreased self-esteem. So we're going to monitor these patients for decreased tissue perfusion. So monitor the pulses and again the um, skin temperature and color. Manage acute and persistent pain, promote mobility, and promote self-esteem. This slide shows how you would initially do a dressing for a stump. Um, most of the time, you know, the surgeon will have done this. Um, but this is how you would do it if you had to do it. So as far as home care, these people are going to need some physical therapy, occupational therapy. Perhaps um, you need to educate them on limb and prosthetic care. They need to be wearing that prosthesis anytime they're mobile. mobile. Um, you need to watch for signs of infection and keep everything clean. Our healthcare resources include the Amputee Coalition of America and the National Amputation Foundation. So we want to make sure that they have good pulses in their residual limb, make sure their pain is controlled, that they can do mobility skills, they can um, walk or move independently without falling, you know, teach them how to use their devices correctly. Um, and their prosthetics, they remain free from surgical site infection, and they are able to adapt their lifestyle so that they have positive self-esteem. You may have heard of carpal tunnel syndrome. A lot of nurses get this from our repetitive using our hands. The medium, median nerve in the wrist becomes compressed. There's pain and numbness. Um, it is, like I said, a repetitive stress injury usually presents as a chronic problem. Now they can do carpal tunnel surgery where they um, cut that nerve and release it. Um, also common complication of certain metabolic and connective tissue diseases. So you'll learn about that next semester. The prevention of carpal tunnel syndrome includes ergonomically appropriate workstations. The pain may be worse at night. They will experience numbness and paresthesia, that um, pins and needles feeling. The phalanx maneuver you should have learned when you learned your head to toe assessment last semester. So go over that. We are going to immobilize the wrist by using a wrist brace. You can apply ice, um, use analgesics, of course, for the pain. And then, like I said, um, there is a nerve decompression that they can do surgically to relieve the stress on that nerve. If there's any trauma to the knee, it can cause cartilage, ligament, and tendon injury. You want to use the RICE mnemonic. You probably have heard of this. Rest, ice, compression, and elevate. I've always heard that rotator cuff injuries and surgery are some of the most painful that people will have. The rotator cuff injury usually occurs as a result of throwing something or lifting something heavy or maybe from a fall. Um, you use NSAIDs, intermittent steroid injections, and physical therapy, as well as limiting um, activity, limiting mobility of the rotator cuff of the shoulder, okay, um, in order to help it heal and to decrease pain. And that's a partial thickness tear. If it's a full tear of the rotator cuff, they're going to have to have surgery for that. And that's after that, you will be using um, plenty of analgesics. Okay. Let's see. Is there anything else I need to go over with you? Um, I don't think so. So no, um, table 47.3, the examples of acute soft tissue musculoskeletal injuries. Okay, and the management of those. Thank you very much.